For those of you on Zoom, we ask that you please mute your microphones and place your questions in the chat box. For those of you on Facebook, please mute your questions and put them in the comment section. First, let me bring you the latest numbers regarding the Dixie Fire. The Dixie Fire is currently at 220,012 acres with 23% containment. There are currently 5,931 personnel assigned to the incident. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker. Please welcome from the West Zone, Fire Behavior Analyst, John Cook. Okay, good evening. My name is John Cook. I'll be handling weather and fire behavior. Um, to kind of summarize the weather we're experiencing and going to experience the next several days, uh, we've got a return to a hot, dry, and breezy conditions. Uh, it's also a very, what we call, unstable atmosphere, which is why you're able to see all that smoke go up in the air today. Um, and those conditions are probably going to last uh, at least through Friday going into s Saturday. Um, also, the smoke that I guess a lot of you have probably been dealing with, um, that smoke that's generated up here on the fire, it works its way down drain, and that, that pattern is going to continue um, and, until we get some big change in some of the, uh, the overall general wind conditions. So the smoke you're experiencing down the valley and some of the local areas, um, that smoke goes up during the day. Some of it settles down, works its way down through the valleys to you, and that's going to continue. So until we have a bigger pattern change in the weather, um, that's just going to be the continuing conditions you're going to deal with. As far as the fire behavior, uh, we're dealing with very critical fuel conditions right now. Um, the fuels are much drier than they would be normally this time of year. And when they're dry, they're much harder to contain. Much, they're, e they're easily ignite on fire, obviously. It's high fire danger. They're harder to control and harder to put out. Um, things that are very large fuels, the size of, you know, the big trees that are out there, the stuff even that's the size of your arm or bigger, those things are all consuming and, and very, very difficult for the firefighters to get to and contain. So doing a great job putting a line around the fire, but dealing with all those dry fuels around all these miles and miles of fire line is a real challenge. And until we get some other relief, uh, that's going to continue. I think some of you all saw the smoke today. Um, if you did, it was coming off of this side of the fire, burning interior, some areas that are inside the fire. But again, that's just big areas consuming away from the line. But the unstable atmosphere, the dryness of the fuels is all contributing to this difficulty in controlling, um, you know, getting this thing put out. Even with air tankers and dropping water on these type of fuels, you can drop water from above, but the dryness, even you can't get underneath all that. So um, people think sometimes you can drop water and it's just going to put it all out. Well, not in these type of fuels and not in these type of conditions. So I uh, just wanted to kind of go over that a little bit. There's a lot of effort being done to get that water out there, but it's, it's a very difficult environment to just put it all out. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will from the West Zone, Operations Section Chief, Cal Fire Incident Management Team 1, Chief Mike Wink. Good evening and thank you for joining us again. Just as a reminder, the split on the East-West Zone is that Highway 70 corridor up to the Caribou drainage to Lake Almanor to the east and then the northeast along that dotted line. So we'll start here on the Highway 70 corridor. We continue to uh, do mop-up and tactical troll on the on the Highway 70 corridor, looking for those hot spots, doing critical infrastructure protection, and working with our cooperators and collaborators on the roadway with Caltrans, working on making the roadway safe, hazard tree removal, uh, protecting the utilities, utility restoration, and um, them in there looking at their critical infrastructure as well. So that's the Highway 70 corridor. Uh, we're also working across the zone break to the east, uh, supporting the operations over here in uh, in the east zone, uh, here along the Highway 70 corridor and here in the Caribou drainage. So we're working collaboratively and cooperatively with those folks. As we get down here to the fire's edge off of Highway 70, the division's Alpha Bravo Charlie, no change in there, tactical patrol, everything was holding in Division Charlie. They're doing mop up, uh, building depth on that so we don't have any ember cast or any uh, spot fires or embers come outside the line. So that's going well. The, um, the big story is in Division Echo and Foxtrot. Okay, that's around the community of Jonesville and Butte Meadows. Okay, there's a dozer line out here I'm pointing to. So that is as uh, projected to be a multi-day operation to slowly bring it from Butte Creek off of Cherry Hill 
and to slowly bring it when the conditions are right around this dozer line to a place where we can control the fire's edge because that's the safest for us to do. That's the safest for everybody involved in here on the fire's edge where it is right now. Very rugged, very steep, inaccessible, not a good place for firefighters to try and hold that line. Not a high probability of success. That's why we build this box out here, okay? But we have to wait for the right conditions. They tried it last night. The humidities were too high. They had to stop it. They're going to try it again this afternoon and tonight. They have a good plan in place. We have plenty of resources, and that's going to be ongoing. They're going to pick up this fire's edge right here and slowly see how far they can go. We anticipate this to be a multi-day operation to do it safely and controlled with the, how we want to engage the fire. Okay, that's the big story there. Coming up here in, uh, to the branch break in David, Ida, and Juliet. So we come up to Humboldt Summit. Uh, that's all looking good, holding those actions. Coming across Humboldt Road all the way over here towards Lake Almanor. The holding the road, that's looking really well. Uh, that's the road we pre-treated with 65,000 gallons of retardant out of water tenders. Okay, that's a lot of retardant. Pre-treating the green side of the road to make sure that ember casts and spot fires are resistant to any types of uh, fuels being ignited by the main fire. This all continues to burn in. So we have the edge of the fire we brought out here, the road that's the safest for firefighters and gives us the highest probability of success. There's all this unburned fuel between the main fire and there. That's going to continue to burn. Uh, whether we are helping it along, trying to do low intensity fire and consume that, because if the sooner we get that consumed, the higher probability it will not threaten our line and throw embers and spot fires across the line. So that's an important piece for these to become enclosed with low intensity fire that we control under our leadership. Okay, so that's part of our plan. As we're coming now up in the upper Ohio road system along Highway 89, um, that's all holding and going well. Uh, once again, we're uh, getting, trying to get the main fire to meet our fire's edge here to consume those fuels in low intensity once again so we don't threaten our line up here. As we come to the Butte Valley Reservoir, um, there's, uh, we're going direct on this spot right here and we're cutting this stuff out, okay? And we're going to try and hold that stuff in place. Everything's been holding in the caribou drainage. So working on containing this. Got this spot fire contained. Everything's holding from the powerhouse down the Caribou Road, down to Highway 70. And once again, same message up here off of Highway 89 in the upper piece as we are down here on Highway 70. We're working with our partners in the East Zone, sharing resources, sharing leadership, having a common goal. Three base camps, one large fire, 5,000 firefighters, 80 miles of fire line out there. We're all working under the same common goal, sharing leadership, making sure we have the same plan. And that is your evening update. Thank you. From the East Zone, California Incident Management Team 2, Operations Section Chief, John Goss. Based on the conditions that we received yesterday, a little bit of precip occurred over the bulk of the East Zone, uh, provided us some opportunities that we're, we're currently taking advantage. So tonight, I'm going to start down in the Highway 70 quarter corridor about two miles down river of Twain. So Rust Creek Road, you'll see this fire perimeter's edge here. It's about 22 miles on the direct edge all the way uh, from Rust Creek up to Eagle Rock and eventually over to uh, Bella Flats at the Round Valley Reservoir. So what we're doing on that piece of the line uh, based on yesterday's weather uh, and the ability of resources, we're gonna go direct on that fire's edge. So that's gonna be a combination of using road systems uh, some old dozer lines from the chips fire and some hand line construction with our uh, with our hotshot crews there. So we've got uh, started last night. We probably out of that 22 miles, we've got approximately uh, eight to nine of those miles completed. Uh, so the objective in this section of the fire is to go direct on that fire's edge. Now, in case that direct option does not work, then the dozer lines that are uh, have been in place for the last couple of days, then we'll have to fall back to those dozer lines. Uh, but for now, we're very optimistic. Uh, that the direct attack approach is going to work and be successful. Okay, so coming down from Bella Flats down into Moccasin and the Highway 89 corridor, that piece of line was burned last night and it continues to hold, and we're in the process of securing and mopping up that fire's edge. Okay, leaving uh, Highway 89 and heading up towards uh, Mount Huff from the Taylorsville side, 
uh, line that the firefighters today spent the bulk of the day prepping road, and that's the immigrant road uh, as, you, as you head up towards Mount Huff. Uh, conditions last night were not conducive to any firing operations, real similar to what the West Zone is experiencing. Uh, but tonight we believe that those conditions uh, are in a good spot there to uh, reinitiate those firing operations there. Uh, so for Mount Huff down the Mount Huff Road on the Quincy side, uh, we were able to get about uh, three quarters more hand line and road systems there uh, in the firing operation last night that was completed. Uh, all those lines are currently holding and the plan for tonight is to continue those firing operations uh, from the Mount Huff Road down in uh, to Spanish Creek. Uh, so for the folks in Quincy, you will be seeing some uh, increased uh, oh, fire activity and some flames on the side of the hill, and that is a, a planned operation that we'll be starting or continuing tonight. Once we get down uh, Spanish Creek in the Ketty area, this little U-shaped portion of the incident there, basically uh, in and around Butterfly Valley, uh, we're able to get some containment on that piece of the line there. So we're, feel, we're feeling very optimistic that there, there will not be any further spread in this portion of the fire. So... Uh, we're calling that percentage contained there. Uh, moving across, going towards uh, Humbly Ravine, there's a little section that's about a 600 acre piece that we uh, started firing operations about two hours ago, and we'll continue that uh, this evening. And then again, once we get that small piece of uh, unburned fuel between, then we'll be able to secure that fire's edge and call this piece contained as well. Uh, moving down in between Silver Lake and Bucks Lake, uh, Resources, resources were engaged heavily today. That's where we've got our hotshot crews uh, up in the wilderness areas. They've been spiked out at night, uh, getting up early in the morning and continuing work. Uh, we're hoping to go direct as possible in that particular piece of the fire's edge there. Uh, so we don't have to be down in the Meadow Valley there as far as any kind of firing operations again. So we'll continue that direct uh, handline approach there from Silver Lake down to Bucks Lake. Uh, with hopes of keeping it up on top of the slope versus down uh, closer to Highway 162. Uh, and from uh, Bucks Lake, uh, heading in a westerly direction, uh, road systems uh, continue to hold, and that gets you back down into Rock Creek uh, on the Highway 70 corridor. And again, we're, uh, we've got some containment in that section of line as well, and we don't expect any uh, further southerly movement. Thank you. We will now hear from Plumas County Sheriff's Office Sheriff Todd Johns. Todd Johns. So today, again, we have no changes uh, to our evacuation orders or warnings today. That's excellent news for the community. Uh, damage assessment is ongoing. Uh, residents can visit plumascounty.us. Again, that's plumascounty.us. Click on the Dixie Fire tab and then click on the recovery tab. From there, you can review information related to recovery and view a map link, which will direct you to a site to look up damage. And we still have shelters that are open in Quincy, Chester, and Susanville. Uh, we have approximately 67 people that are staying in shelters right now. A monetary donation account has been established at Plumas Bank in conjunction with PCIRC. Please visit a Plumas Bank location in person to donate. On loan di online donation access is in the process of being created. I've received some questions about FEMA buses that have been seen in Plumas County, uh, specifically in the Gray Area, Gray Eagle area, uh, there to help the U.S. Forest Service with radio communications. that we were having issues with the garbage in Plumas County, specifically Chester and Quincy that was not being picked up. Waste management has informed us that due to the safety of their employees and the air quality, they will still not be providing street service. They stated they will service the hospitals and fire camps. Arrangements have been made to open the Chester transfer site on Mondays and Thursdays for drop off and the Quincy site will be open Wednesday and Saturday for drop off. Current waste management customers can use this service for free of charge. The hours will be nine to five with the lunch from 12 to 1230. We also discussed a mail issue yesterday. Uh, we worked with the United States Postal Service. Uh, mail started uh, being delivered today. Uh, we actually escorted two trucks through Highway 70 from Chico with Caltrans assistance. 
And for folks that have been evacuated, um, your mail can be picked up in Quincy at this time. We're gonna continue to work with the US Postal Service to see if uh, we could identify folks that are um, in shelters and, and possibly be able to transfer that mail there. Uh, however, that might take a bit of time. So for now, you can pick up your mail uh, in Quincy. At this time, no federal declaration uh, for federal aid has been done. Uh, we don't meet that criteria. However, we have um, requested assistance from the California Disaster Assistance Act. So I've been contacted numerous times today about repopulation to the areas that have been evacuated within the county. Uh, if I can cover just a few of those, um, and actually I should start by saying this, as I've said numerous times, I am committed to get folks to their, back to their residence as soon as possible, but I need to do that safely. And by doing that, I, I work with the incident teams, both the incident teams in Quincy and in Butte County. Uh, we have daily discussions as to when we believe it is safe to do so. And I will tell you that currently right now, uh, besides personal family members, uh, I have 55 people that are staying in shelters and 12 of those and 12 people additional to that are staying outside of the shelters because they have animals and they don't want to put their animals up in an animal shelter. Not to mention the hundreds or thousands of residents that have left their communities and are staying with friends and family out of the area. I recognize the fact that we need to get folks back to their houses, but I will ask that you give me a little bit of patience. I uh, am committed to get you back to your residence as soon as possible, and again, to do it safely. I know for some that may not be fast enough, but I will get it done. I also wanna let those folks know that have uh, decided to stay in evacuated areas that I've um, personally contacted my Lima officers, my law enforcement mutual aid officers that are patrolling those areas. I've asked them to step up contacts in those areas to make sure that folks who are there are staying in or around their residence or possibly if they go to a grocery store to get groceries, but that would be it. If you are in an evacuated area, you cannot leave your residence and freely move about the community. So if you are doing that, just understand that you will uh, see and probably be contacted by law enforcement personnel. Again, I wanna thank all of the hardworking folks that are uh, in my office, uh, my clerical staff, my dispatchers, my correctional officers have done an amazing job uh, feeding my Lima officers, um, and then my staff that are around me, my deputies. And I also wanna thank the community as always. Um, the support has been overwhelming in this incident, which is um, something to the likes that we've never seen in Plumas County, so thank you. Next, we will hear from Supervisor for Plumas National Forest, Chris Carlton. I am to, uh, to join us here. Uh, like to just kind of acknowledge some of the questions we see most popping up in the chat there. Um, you know, as, as, as I scroll through, it's um, when can I go home? Is my house okay? Um, and, and then a couple, you know, we get some questions about are there resources on the, on the fire? And, uh, you know, Sheriff John's really talked a lot about, you know, the, the when can people go home part. Um, you know, I, I think we all recognize the need to, to let law enforcement get in there and do what they need to do um, and to make sure we keep those areas free and available for the firefighters. You know, we're seeing a lot of really good progress out there, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to wrap our heads, at least I know for me it is, around a 220,000 acre fire. Um, that's, I think somebody said something like 82 miles around the perimeter. And uh, that's, that's a lot of fire out there. Um, and, and so I know that they're doing everything they can to get that control contained um, to get line out there and they're putting all the resources to it. So um, let's, let's continue giving them the space to do what they need to do so that when we can go home and deal with all the impacts we're gonna have, um, 
we can do that safely. I also wanted to, to just say a special acknowledgement. Um, you know, we have a lot of firefighters in here from out of the area, and uh, the, so far they have been great guests. Um, really appreciate all that they're doing. I also want to acknowledge that we have a lot of firefighters and a lot of first responders from within our communities. Many of them are going to work every day and their families are also evacuated um, out of town and they're here put, putting, in, uh, putting in some hard work for all of us uh, day in and day out um, while, while navigating what I think a, a lot of us are, the, all the impacts of this incident. So really just a special thank you um, to all the folks in the community who are supporting this incident, even while they're struggling with their own um, evacuations and challenges and that kind of stuff. So thank you. Um, and, and then just lastly, uh, a couple of positive notes. Um, we're seeing some really good progress out there. You know, we, we do have a ways to go and, and fire behavior has been really unpredictable, but it's, it's reassuring to see the increase in, uh, in containment on the map, to see all the hard work that they're putting in. And uh, we're up to 5,900, over 5,900 firefighters on this incident. Uh, so the fire, the fire has gotten a little bit bigger, but our resources have gotten a lot bigger. And so I really want to acknowledge just that full suppression strategy. They are working day and night to get this fire. So thanks again. Have a, have a safe evening and see you tomorrow. Next up will be Agency Administrator for Lassen National Forest, Scott Tengenberg. Good evening. Thank you very much for everyone who's joining us on the presentation tonight. Just as Supervisor Carlton just mentioned, this fire is immense and it's affecting so many communities across Lassen, Butte, and Plumas counties. I want to particularly acknowledge some of those effects and some of the anxiety that individuals may be feeling, particularly those homeowners in the Butte Meadows and Jonesville and Philbrook Reservoir area. As Supervisor Carlton just mentioned, there are indeed thousands of firefighters out there doing everything they can to take care of not only those residences and the important things associated with those, but also the resources that exist out there the places you love to hunt, the places you love to fish, the beautiful forest that you hope to return to once all of this is over. I also am interested in getting back into that beautiful forest. And although sections of it will be devastated by this fire, the forest does rebuild. And while it will be hard to deal with, a lot of the things that will be significantly changed Please have hope. Please look forward to a brighter future for your area. Thank you. From the West Zone, we have Damage Inspection Manager Trainee, Chief Jeff Hakala. Good evening. Jeff Hakala, Damage Inspection Manager Trainee for the Dixie Fire. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our damage inspection process and what criteria we're utilizing. So currently, to date, we have approximately six personnel, um, two teams, and two managers that are assigned to the Dixie Fire. Basically, what the um, damage inspection teams are in charge of is to do a systematic search of all structures within the fire's perimeter. And using several different tracking several uh, using several different tracking mechanisms we utilize uh, for our teams they use several different apps a collector application that will be utilized for identifying the structures we use several different um, um, uh, criteria for that and then, um, we have a quick capture uh, tracking mechanism that verifies that the structures have actually been um, searched and and validated all that information then gets uploaded at the end of the day and we as managers have to use basically a, uh, a QAQC kind of quality control to vet all the information to make sure that it is accurate. We look at whether the attributes have been filled out, um, all the data has been um, validated, and then that information then gets pushed to the local um, 
the local EO, EOC through Plumas County. Uh, Sheriff Johns mentioned that all that information is then available on the Plumas County website. Additionally, at, uh, that update goes out at 0900 every day. So nine o'clock daily, you'll be able to access that website information and see where your structure is, um, whether what condition it may be in. Um, I encourage everyone to look at that and some of the criteria that we utilize on what structures that we actually, you know, gather. Anything that has 120 square feet or 120 square feet with a permanent foundation, that's the criteria because that's typically the trigger of the county to create the permit process. We also additionally will, uh, we understand that most people, some people utilize uh, um, temporary habitable structures such as fifth wheels or campers. Those will also be captured as part of the data and the criteria. Um, once again, to understand that this is a very slow, systematic approach, and when you look at the web application, if you're clicking or trying to find your address, sometimes the address may throw a different area. Please zoom into the area that you know where your location is, and, and that's where you'll find your information. But the address selection box it typically brings you to the, the location that you want to look at to validate whether your structure has been damaged or, or destroyed. Um, once again, uh, please check the website, and like I said, it's updated daily at, at 0900. Thank you. Our final speaker from the West Zone, Incident Commander Chief George Wong. Good evening. My name is George Wong, and I serve as the Deputy Incident Commander for CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 1 and Unified Incident Commander with the Forest Service and California Team 2. As Chief Wink stated earlier, we currently is 220,000 acres, 220 and 12,000 acres. We have almost over 6,000 personnel assigned to this incident. We have, over, we have 10,721 structures remain threatened, and we have an estimate of 16,000 residents evacuated. We have over 100 agencies cooperating together to fight the Dixie Fire. We are working side by side with the Forest Service, Butte County Sheriff, Plumas County Sheriff, and we have California National Guard assisting us with crews and with air assets. Lastly, thank you to all the citizens of Plumas County, Butte County, for being patient. We are committed to fight this fire here in the counties with you, and we are committed to serve you. Thank you. A majority of our questions tonight were answered during the presentation from our speakers. We'll now move on to the period of answering a few of those outstanding questions. We'd like to bring back Chief Mike Wink. All right, I've got quite a few questions here this evening, so I'll just go through each of them. So will there be any backfiring operations tonight? So um, we talk, I talked about here in the Butte Meadows area that this uh, dozer line out here is going to be a multi-day process to bring the fire's edge from where it is now around the, on that dozer line because that is the safest place and gives us the highest probability of success for the firefighters, for us to control what it's doing, bring the fire's edge out to here so we can mop it up and contain it. And so those operations will be going on in here tonight and for the next several days, because this is going to take multiple days. It's very complex. There's a lot of drainages. There's a lot of heavy fuel. We have to watch the weather conditions have to be just right so we don't create too much intensity and, um, you know, throw embers and stuff across the line. That's also going to be ongoing in all these areas that are open, okay? Our control line is on Humboldt Road and the Upper Ohio Road. Okay, and then the main fire is just off of that. It's very important that very slowly, low intensity fire, that all these areas turn into this red shaded color. It doesn't mean everything in there is destroyed and uh, you know just terrible devastation. Our intent is to do as much low intensity fire as possible so it's ground fire, it doesn't get up into the trees, it doesn't create that devastation. That is our intent, but we have to remove those fuels so that these green pockets don't get flared up, get high intensity fire in them that resist our control efforts and throw spot fires across the line. So that's very important.
are the cabins in the Ohio Valley uh, in danger? So the Ohio uh, Valley road system is in here. So for multiple days, we've had engines in here. They're familiar with those structures and those uh, improvements, those homes and cabins. Um, there's no report of any damage or destroyed infrastructure or private property in here. And now we are in here uh, mopping this all up because we needed to create that buffer along this road system. So no reports of any damage in there. A question about Chester. Once again, Chester is uh, directly north off of this point on the fire where we put black line in last night. Uh, we anticipate that that black line, that's the part that we, you know, those black lines on the map show the parts we're the most confident that we have built in enough depth that that line is going to hold, that it's not going to be threatened by additional uh, uh, fire interior. But it's really important that we get these con fuels consumed in here, and we get all these, and we get all these, and we get this stuff in here so it doesn't threaten our line. So that's really important that we have to do those operations to get those fuels reduced so that it doesn't threaten our line so we can continue putting those containment lines on the map and that gets things closer to uh, back to normal. One question is that the Canyon Dam area threatened. So Canyon Dam is right in this general area. So um, things are looking really good in there. We're mopping up all that stuff. We have a lot of resources along that Highway 89 corridor. We have surge resources every day in case if fire intensity picks up in any area of the fire, we have those surge resources that can get out there. That's the same. There's multiple questions all, all along the communities on the shore here, kind of on the west side of Elmore, Prattville, West Elmanor, the Highway 47 corridor, you know, same thing. We've got to get this mopped up. And then we have to um, work with our partners to the east and get this taken care of so we can have a lot more confidence to take these areas of concern uh, you know, out, of the, um, out of the concern. So a question about the cabins here in Jonesville. So uh, there's no report of any damage or destroyed structures in Jonesville. So that operation um, of low intensity fire in that area, uh, as of right now, everything that we know and all the feedback we've gotten, no damage or destruction in there. And then why isn't the containment going up? So the containment hasn't been going up uh, just because we have to get those areas mopped up. So you'll, you'll see, uh, I keep talking about Division Charlie, for example, really good in here probably see some containment go up in here you'll see some black line in here in the next day or so same thing up here we're feeling pretty good about this but we got to get this area these fuels in here consumed and then we'll start to build off of there and go both ways and that's how we're uh, creating our anchors so to speak and then we continue to mop up and get those contained so that's it for your questions tonight thank you we will now return to the east zone of our incident with Operations Section Chief John Goss. We've got three questions here for the East Zone. So I will start with the first one. Uh, it's the status on Bucks Lake and Meadow Valley. There may have been some connectivity problems when I was going over my uh, initial report. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start that one again. So <clears> how <throat> this Bucks Lake area, Bucks Lake Wilderness, uh, we've got our hotshot crews out there currently going direct on the fire's edge because, again, that's that's our most advantageous position to be in is is being right up next to that fire's edge there. So that's our first plan in here to keep fire from progressing in a southerly direction down towards the Oral Quincy Highway. We've also got three other backup plans or contingency plans or alternate plans there uh, in the event that this direct attack or direct action on the fire's edge does not work. Uh, we've got dozer lines completely surrounding the community of Meadow Valley. We've got dozer lines running in a, oh, a northwest direction back up to the wilderness as well. So that gives us some options on uh, keeping that fire's edge out of Meadow Valley. So uh, right now, again, uh, currently there's no threat to uh, Meadow Valley uh, or, or, or Bucks Lake because the fire is still on the slope above those, uh, those communities. Uh, a question came in about the status of Oakland Camp. Oakland Camp is just on the outskirts, just north here in Quincy. 
Uh, so Quincy uh, Oakland camp currently is outside the current fire perimeter uh, and is not impacted by uh, the fire's edge. Uh, last question. I know this was a West Zone question as well, uh, but I'll go ahead and answer. Uh, we are doing some front operations tonight on the East Zone as well. Uh, Humbly Ravine, which is down in, uh, closer to the Highway 70 corridor. There's a small piece of dozer line that is in place. And again, it's about a 500 acre um, perimeter that we plan on burning tonight. Uh, two other areas that we also uh, have intention of burning is the slope facing Quincy here. So from Mountain Huff down the Mountain Huff Road, uh, we've got about a mile and a half, a uh, mile and three quarters of dozer line that we will be burning tonight. Uh, so again, the folks in Quincy will be able to see that visibly from, uh, from town. Uh, and real similar to what the West Zone is doing, we're, we're taking our time, bringing it slowly down the slope of Mount Huff. Uh, that gives us the ability to uh, keep those fire effects or that fire behavior at a low intensity, you know, one to two foot flame blanks, which keeps that, you know, that fire out of the trees and up in the canopy and out of the brush. Uh, so this will be a, uh, another two nights as far as burning that uh, piece of line that the, the folks in Quincy could see. Uh, the, the third area is on the backside of Mount, High, Mount Huff, which is basically the, the slope uh, above Taylorsville. Uh, and if we get some opportunities uh, tonight uh, to do some fire operations, uh, we're going to take advantage of that cooler air. Uh, so again, it's, it's when we're doing, when we're conducting fire, firing operations, uh, we like to have every advantage on our side. So the, the lack of sunlight, uh, the cooler temperatures, uh, the higher humidities, uh, that's why uh, the bulk, 98% of our firing operations are being done in the evening and overnight hours. So uh, we've got folks out there 24 hours a day. And so when we do get spots or any uh, pieces of fire spread over our containment lines, we've got the resources there uh, to contain those spots and those, um, uh, those areas of the fire that have increased in activity. Thank you. We have also received requests regarding Plumas County Sheriff's Office. We will now go to Sheriff Todd Johns. About uh, Trash and Chester, specifically at the Vets Hall and the Rec Hall, uh, I will get in contact with Waste Management to see if uh, we can't make that happen. And additionally, we continue to work with Waste Management, uh, who I understand is short staffed, uh, to try to get all mail in non-evacuated areas picked up. So we will continue to work with them closely and uh, help them out as we can. I received a question about uh, Chester. So Chester is currently under an evacuation warning, um, which means that you can, in fact, return to your residence anytime you like. Uh, but I will again say you see the active fire here and you see that Chester's right here. When we initially evacuated or gave uh, Chester the um, warning, it was because we were having sustained winds on a daily basis, and we know that the fire was pushing there. Uh, again, I would ask residents to be cautious of that, um, be ready to go should we get sustained winds again. Um, but at this time, if you have left Chester, you can certainly return. Uh, it is still under an evacuation warning, though. And finally, I received a question on um, mandatory versus a warning. So. If you have received a warning, you are free to move about the area that uh, received the warning. Chester is an example that you can move freely around the town of Chester. There's no restrictions. If you are in a mandatorily evacuated area, an, an, an area that um, has received that mandatory evacuation, you cannot freely move about that area. Now, I'm not insensitive to folks that have stayed, particularly in the Greenville area, that may need basic necessities uh, and have gone to the grocery store. Uh, my comments earlier were not a threat. They were me advising the citizens who have stayed in evacuated areas that you may be contacted by law enforcement officers to determine what you're doing. Okay, folks that live there and are conducting basic necessity runs to the store um, will be free to go. Make no mistake, if you are in an evacuated area and you're conducting criminal activity, we will arrest you, period. Okay, I want there to be no mistake. Again, I um, am fully committed to protecting people's property. I will do so to the best of my ability. 
I have been patrolling these areas myself. I did so today. I did so yesterday. My staff are. And I have law enforcement mutual aid officers that are doing the same. I appreciate the continued support of the community. Thank you. We do appreciate all the questions that have come in this evening. We'd like to thank all the presenters for their information. If you would like to find the evacuation maps for Plumas and Butte counties, you may find those listed on your respective websites. After this presentation, a QR code will appear that will link you with the evacuation maps. Incident updates will be provided at 7 o'clock a.m. and 7 o'clock p.m. Also, at the end of this presentation, there is a list of all the information boards out in the community. Please take advantage of looking at this list, and if you'd like to speak to someone in person, you may go to that information board tomorrow. We will have personnel there with updated information for your community. Join us tomorrow on Facebook as well as Zoom for a Dixie incident update. In the meantime, you may go to InsaWeb and search under Dixie incident for the latest information. You may also go to CAL FIRE homepage at www.ca.fire.gov. Please continue to follow social media platforms for the Alaska National Forest, Plumas National Forest, CAL FIRE BTU. We appreciate your time this evening. Thank you for joining us.